Good morning. How are y'all this morning? Talkative. Talkative, yeah. Welcome to Epworth on this beautiful Sunday morning. So glad all of you are here to praise God and worship God. And all of you out there, we're glad that you're with us too. Uh, if you're able, please stand for the call to worship. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. To God be the glory. Great is the faithfulness of our God. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Let us praise and worship the Lord. John? No oh, amen. All right. <laughs> Great is thy faithfulness.
If you will, join me in the opening prayer. Compassionate God, you have watched over us this past week, protecting us and leading us in both seen and unseen ways. Thank you for all your good gifts, from loving families and friends to daily provisions of food and shelter. Most of all, thank you, Father, for sending your Son and the Holy Spirit to grant us your mercy and grace, saving us from sin and death, so we might become people of mercy and bearers of hope to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. And welcome to worship on this Super Sunday, right? Every Sunday is a super Sunday when we have a God who is so faithful, great is his faithfulness, and we come to worship him and be faithful to the one who gives us life, who gives us mercy, who gives us every blessing. And so your presence, your physical presence is, is something you do for God to, to show him your love. And so thank you for coming to worship today and watching online and worshiping at home or Wherever you are, some of you are out of state or miles away, so we're thankful that you're present with us online to worship this day. And so we uh, do have soup today, and uh, as it is the Super Bowl Sunday, so you'll have a soup for your bowl if you want to purchase that at the end of the service. United Methodist women have uh, uh, made that and made delicious soup. They do that every year. And you can see in your bulletin the many mission projects that it supports when you give generously. You can make a donation uh, to support their work. You can see on the altar today, um, altar flowers. Where are those flowers? See, I can't see. You can see them, but <laughs> I knew they were up there somewhere. But that is to say thank you to Bobby Goff for the many years of service that she's given uh, to the women there. Notice a uh, meeting uh, coming up soon with the finance committee, and uh, that's not until next week, and then our church council meeting. By golly, Ash Wednesday's coming up soon, isn't it? It's a week from this Wednesday. We have the Shrove Tuesday uh, pancake dinner before that, so I know you'll want to be there. Uh, a great time each year when we can do that. It's the first time we've been able to do it since the pandemic, so it would be great to come back together in this way. Notice uh, there's some great training going on with the Lay Academy. That's there. And I do hope uh, some of you will uh, join me on just a Saturday from 10 to about 3 on new places and uh, new people. How do we reach people for Christ today? It, it's harder than ever, isn't it? So uh, let me know if you want to go and be a part of that. Uh, some great ideas. I've, I've already read some of the book on it, and uh, it, it might help us think about that we still have opportunities. We can do this with the help of God and a little bit of training and some new ideas. So I hope you'll join me in that. Uh, please fill out your connection card. Um, if you do that each week, all we need is your name and attendance marked here. Put that in the offering plate along with your gift. We thank you for your faithful giving. As God is faithful, we want to be faithful in return, to return to God uh, his tithe and our offerings. So please um, give as generously as you can, whether you send it into the church or you give electronically uh, through even a QR code on your phone. That We try to make it easy for you. Are there any other announcements at this time? Okay. Was, what was that? Okay, we're going on to concerns now. And, uh, yeah, Fred Batten, as we move into our, our concerns and our blessings, uh, we grieve because we have lost an Epworth saint. Uh, Fred passed away yesterday morning, and uh, I don't know any uh, arrangements at this time, but I'm sure we'll want to support the Batten family. Um, and uh, we keep them in our prayers. I'm sure heaven is filled with 
the sounds of Fred singing, yeah. isn't it? I mean, he, yeah, <laughs> happy trails, yeah, and put a smile on everyone's face. That's what Fred wanted to do. So he's blessed this church with music and love and laughter as well as the high school and this whole community for many, many years. And uh, so we give God praise for him. We'll get out information as we uh, have it. But as we um, move into the area of praises and uh, concerns, I, I do want to start with praises um, and uh, thank those of you who uh, helped us today with the lunch. And we had a reaching out to bring compassion of Jesus to those who, who need a lift and encouragement of Christ. And so I understand that went well. There were three families that are returning. So that says a lot that they're returning, they're coming back. They're thinking, well, there's something here. There's people who love and care about us. And uh, so thank you. We look forward to the next uh, community lunch that we can do. We also I'm, have to give God praise for my little Lucy. I got to go to Pittsburgh yesterday and celebrate with uh, her first birthday, one of our five grandchildren. And um, just a, a real blessing, every child that we have, or grandchild, or great great grandchild. Uh, <clears throat> we do have, a, we do got, praise God, that uh, Dick Casto is getting better, but he's still not out of the woods yet. Might be in the hospital a couple more days, but let's keep praying for Dick and, and get him home. And I know uh, the whole family wants him back home. And uh, so. He's being positive. He said this morning he thought he was doing a little better, but it's in increments, isn't it? A little bit slower than we would like it to be. So we miss Dick when he's not here. <clears throat> we also have um, concerns not just with the Batten family, but uh, Dan Ellerman, who is the husband of our custodian, Megan Hartley Ellerman, uh, his father, <clears throat> um, no, it was his mother just passed away. His father passed away in September, and that funeral is tomorrow. So we want to pray for them and also the Steve Matheny family. Um, there is so much death and suffering, as you know, in Turkey and Syria right now. And uh, we're thankful that the United Methodist Committee on Relief is there. We want to continue to support the ministries of our church. They have a, a special <clears throat> offering next week. For those of you who want to uh, support that. Okay, are there any other announcements um, or prayer concerns that we need to lift up this morning? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, give you praise and thanks for your faithfulness. You gave us a new day, and thank you for the mercies that are made new. And so, Lord, we come. We come because you're our God. We come because you love us. We come because you came in Jesus Christ. We come because the Holy Spirit shows up here in a special way when we gather to worship. And we're grateful that there are blessings to be found as we sing unto you and as we pray and praise you together as your people, as the body of Christ. We we are able to demonstrate to the world the oneness of the Trinity in the oneness that we have. And yet there's so many things that want to divide us. There's so many differences and distractions. Um, Lord, we just pray that your grace will be greater. Help us to maintain the unity of your body. Help us, O oh God, to love those with, with differences. Help us, O oh God, to show others the possibilities that Jesus gives us. Lord, we're grateful you're a reconciling God, you're a healing God, and, and Lord, we just want to pray for Dick and that you'll uh, continue to help him to heal and to get home. And I lift up uh, my wife, Carolyn, as she prepares for surgery in, a, in, a, in about uh, 10 days and uh, just pray that uh, healing will be on the way uh, for her as well. But Lord, we want your comfort to be with us. We thank you, oh God, for how we've been so blessed by uh, Fred or Ted Batten 
Oh God, he, uh, he has blessed us in ways that we can't describe with his music and his love and his laughter, the, the many lives he's influenced uh, as he uh, led students in the band and um, brought music to our town and our community. Lord, we're, we give you thanks for him. May you comfort his family, help us to celebrate his life well, and to give you honor and praise for giving us him. Help his family, Lord, to know your peace today, as well as those others who are grieving, such as uh, Dan uh, Ellerman and his family and the Matheny family. Others, Lord, who are still grieving uh, because we've lost loved ones recently. May you continue to bring peace and strength and comfort and to know that we have a Savior who comes alongside of us, a Savior who is a man of sorrow and grief. And Lord, we're thankful that you enter into our grief that we might find your peace. Lord, help those who are rescue workers and um, working to help those suffering in the world, whether it's locally or it's in um, Turkey or Ukraine or Syria. We pray for peace with Israel and the Palestinians. Oh, Lord, that conflict continues to be um, just tragic for so many people. Lord, you are the Prince of Peace. Help us, Lord, to hear your voice and to put your will ahead of our own so that your kingdom can come. We lift up our prayers and ourselves, our families, this community, our nation, all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray when we gather. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you would, uh, let's do the Psalter together. Uh, it'll be on the screen. Please stand. Wasn't marking my thing to say that, okay. And by the way, we, aren't, we are not going to do the response. Uh, Ford said I could chant it, but folks, you got lucky. I don't, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord. Who redeems your life from the pit who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord who works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed has made known God's ways to Moses, God's acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord will not always chide nor harbor anger forever. The Lord does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is the Lord's steadfast love toward the faithful. As far as the east is from the west, so far does the Lord remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to the faithful. For the Lord knows our frame and remembers that we are dust.
If the children would join me on the steps, please. I'll try to get down there. Come on up. <laughs> Good morning. Oh, look at all the girl power this morning. Look at that. That's great. All right. We need some boys up here. Where are they? They must have all slept in this morning, huh? Well, there's excitement going on today, isn't there? And then there's a holiday this week with a little bit more excitement, right? So what's today? That crazy ball game they taught, this Super Bowl. Yeah, so that's all the excitement today. And then Tuesday, what's Tuesday? Does anybody know? Valentine's Day. Gosh, you see lots of hearts and flowers that day, huh? And it's exciting. And Hallmark just makes it even more exciting. They make lots of money on that day. But, you see, hearts are my favorite. You know that, don't you? But do we really, really need a day to remind us to love people? We don't need Hallmark to remind us of that, do we? Who reminds us every day we should love each other? Jesus? Is that a good answer? Right. He reminds us every day that we love each other. We don't have to have that holiday. It's nice to show some extra hugs and kisses and love on that day, but we know every day, as long as we keep Jesus where? In our hearts that we know to love each other every day. And we all probably have that special valentine in our hearts, as well as God. We we have earthly valentines. And I think Mr. Kevin over there, he probably thinks he's my valentine. But I have another valentine, too. And he, he knows this valentine, too. But I have a little poem I wanted to share with you all today. And before I forget, I have a little friend in Florida named Samuel, and he's watching this morning. So I want you guys to look out there and say, good morning, Samuel. Oh, you can do better than that. Come on. One, two, three. Good morning, Samuel. Okay. All right. Well, he's watching this morning with his grandma in Florida. So this is my favorite poem for Valentine's Day. You ready? All right. It says, Jesus is my valentine. Jesus is my valentine. I talk to him each day. He never, never leaves me and always listens when I pray. Yes, he is my valentine. There is no love like his. He is the heart of all that is. For him, I breathe and live. He's my valentine that never lies, never hurts or breaks. He always has forgiven me for all the mistakes I've made. If you only know my Valentine, you would love him too. For his love is always perfect. His love is always true. So if your heart is longing for a love that never ends, for someone that is faithful, you know you can depend. Call upon my Valentine. He'll wash away your sin. He will be your Valentine and your bestest, bestest friend. So isn't that a nice poem to remember? So who are we going to remember every day that reminds us that it's Valentine's Day every day if we love people, right? Well, I made each one of you all a copy of this so you can take it home, and that way it'll remind you maybe on Tuesday just that extra special. Share that with your friends and tell them about your special Valentine. Can you do that? All right, take one and pass it on. I think they're picking out the favorite colors or something here. (laughs) And then I have something really special that's going to make you even sweeter, some fun dip. It's pure sugar, pure sugar. And I want you to eat it during church so you're ready to go home, okay? So take one. Well, you all take as many as you want. There's plenty there. And we'll say, say a little prayer before you all go back and sit down. All right, let's bow our heads first. Dear Heaven, help us to understand what love really means. Help us to practice it with those around us, even when it's difficult and even when we don't feel like it. You are an amazing God. We love you so much. The love of Jesus, we love you, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, get your sugar, and you can go back and sit down.
All right. God bless you, John. Great. There's joy in the Lord, and if that doesn't get you fired up, your wood's all wet. (laughs) (laughs) One thing I forgot to mention is we got our books in. uh, Surprise by Hope, N.T. Wright, one of the leading writers of this century. Hope you'll be a part of the study. These study books are free, and uh, you can pick one up out there if you want the uh, other book. That's $12, but all you need is the study book. We'll start out at the Castos, Jackie and Carrie, a week from Thursday, the day after Ash Wednesday. So I hope you'll be a part. It's an exciting thing. If you want to know more about resurrection, where do people go when they die? Um, judgment, what that's about. What's the second coming of Christ? If you don't have all those answers, join this study and learn and discuss it. If you'll join me in standing now for our gospel lesson, it comes from our Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. We're reading chapter 5 of Matthew, verses 1 through 7. When Jesus saw the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. Let us pray. Thanks be to you, O God, for giving us your word. Lord, may these ancient words become for us living words through the power of your Holy Spirit, taking my words and our thoughts together and making them yours. You who are our strength and redeemer, in the name of the one who is the word that was made flesh, we pray. Amen. There was a man who went for a job interview, and he had a, uh, uh, questions that came before him on moral and ethics to see if he could solve the dilemma. And here's how it went. You're driving your car on a wild, stormy night. You pass a bus stop and see three people waiting for the bus. The first person is an old woman who looks like she is about to die. The second person is an old friend of yours who once saved your life. And the third person is the man or woman of your dreams. Which one would you choose to offer a ride, knowing that you could only pick one to ride with you? Now think about, who would you pick out of those three? Well, you could pick up the woman because she's about to die and you could save her life, right? Or you could pick up your old friend who saved your life, and that would be some pretty good payback. Or you may never, ever have the chance to see the perfect person of your dreams. So which one are you going to choose? Well, the person who was hired out of 200 candidates had no trouble answering the question. And he said, I would give the car keys to my old friend, and let him take the old lady about to die to the hospital. (laughs) Then I would wait at the bus stop with the dream of my life. (laughs) Never forget to think outside of the box. (laughs) And isn't that what Jesus is doing here with these Beatitudes on the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus offers us a whole new way of thinking outside of the box. And that's what we're doing these eight weeks here in this sermon series of the Beatitudes, 
uh, from the Sermon on the Mount. They are a summary or an introduction to everything else that's going to take place in that Sermon on the Mount. Everything in the Beatitudes uh, you'll find if you'll read the whole sermon and it's filled, it's packed with wisdom and inspiration that will help you in your life with every problem or decision that you face. It's all in there. The Beatitudes, I like to think, beg the question, what if, what if God could come into the poverty of my soul? What if, if God could come into my grief and pain? What if God could come into my weaknesses and my hunger for justice and, and peace in the world? Well, if God did, then I would be blessed. Then I would be happy. And that's why each one starts out happy is the one or blessed is the one. And today we focus on the fifth beatitude, blessed are the merciful for they will receive mercy. Now, I love mercy. Mercy is great if I get into trouble. <laughs> mercy is great if I get pulled over for speeding. But, you know, it's not so great if I have to extend it to the person who has offended me or hurt me. That's not something that I freely do. I mean person doesn't deserve it, right? I mean, they, they hurt me. They offended me. And isn't mercy just getting out of a penalty that you deserve? Well, that's part of it. That's part of it. And as I've done just about every week, I like to ask the question, what if there was no mercy? What would life be like without mercy? Well, without mercy, there'd be no forgiveness. There wouldn't be reconciliations. It would be an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and it would be a blind and toothless world without mercy. It would be a world of one-upmanship, and the one with the most toys wins, and the losers are just left behind in the dust. If there was no mercy, it would be a world of bitterness and revenge, of judging and condemning other people. It would be a harsh and cold world where everybody just gets what they deserve. It was a world of Ebenezer Scrooge, wasn't it? The way he thought before he was transformed. It would be a world of bah, humbug. <laughs> That's a world without mercy. Without mercy, you might want to blame God for every bad thing that occurs in life. You may not even believe in God without mercy. If you ever saw the movie Signs with Mel Gibson, that's what happened to him. He was a priest, and uh, he left the priesthood, and he turned from God after his wife was tragically killed while she was walking along a roadway, accidentally killed by a driver. But later in the movie, later in the film, it was, it was then that he realized mercy. When he saw the merciful hand of God was, was still there protecting his son from death. And it was after he recognized the mercy of God that he was able to turn back to God and even the priesthood. Mercy always begins with God. God is the author of all mercy. God doesn't cause all the pain and suffering in this world. We live in a fallen and broken world that is separated by God. If we read Scripture correctly, sin separates us from God. Bad things are going to happen to all of us, even to the best of us, to good people. Bad things happen to good people, and there are no exceptions, not even for Jesus who was not exempt from suffering. But God in his mercy will not let the darkness rule. Sin will not win and death will not defeat us. In God's mercy, we have a way back to God. We have forgiveness of sin. We have 
resurrection in our deaths. The greatest sign of God's mercy is the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the greatest sign. He is the way, the truth, and the life, the way to a true and happy life where the, which leads to the place where there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death anymore, as we read in Revelation at the end. In the meantime, in this in-between time in which you and I live, God in His mercy comes to us to give us grace to help, grace that will give us the strength and hope that we need. Life is filled with the evidence of God's mercy, isn't it? This beautiful, sunshiny day is evidence of His mercy. There, is, there are flowers in the spring and harvest in the fall, beautiful sunsets and full moons upon which to look. There is uh, loving and good people in life. Not all is bad. Not all is fallen away to evil. There are happy moments, aren't there? Even before we're Christians... We get to experience goodness and happiness. Why? Why should we have any good if we're in a fallen world? Why should there be any blessings or happy moments? Because of God's mercy. God will not let His creation uh, be taken over completely by the darkness when you see these signs of goodness in life and accept God into your life, you will discover what King David discovered in the 23rd Psalm. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What is mercy? Well, basically it is kindness. The kindness that God extends to us even though we don't deserve it. Mercy is willing the good for someone else. Now God does not deal with us according to our sins. We read that in Psalm 103. Aren't you glad he doesn't deal with us and give us what we deserve? When you discover the experience of that kind of mercy, that we're all guilty, we all fall short, we're as Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You realize, even with all the guilt of everything that we've done wrong, every wrong thought, every wrong deed, or the deeds of good that we failed to do, God does not punish us according to what we deserve. But He gives us mercy. And when you receive mercy, you can't help but become a person of mercy because you have experienced it and you pass it on to somebody else. It's the same way God treats us. Now, mercy isn't just getting out of a penalty or what we deserve or letting other people get off the hook. God says judgment is His. Vengeance is mine. God is a God of judgment and he will take care of judging correctly. We know that in Jesus Christ, he took the judgment that we all deserve, the penalty, so that we can be people of mercy. Judgment comes to the person, though, who refuses to receive God's mercy or who refuses to give mercy. That's where judgment comes in. We judge ourselves. James, the brother of Jesus, understood mercy. You remember, James was a skeptic of Jesus. He didn't follow Jesus early on. It was after Jesus was risen from the dead, and it was almost like, oh, yeah, you really are the Son of God. I just thought you were uh, my brother uh, that I grew up with. And he writes, for judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has no, shown no mercy. For mercy triumphs over judgment. When bad things happen and tragedy hits us, hits us or someone we love, 
our natural tendency is to become angry, bitter, and desire for revenge. And all that will do is consume us. It will consume you. But for those who will choose to trust God and extend mercy to the undeserving, he promises, promises the grace that you need to be a person of mercy, to forgive to, to those who have hurt you, to help and to comfort and strengthen you and to heal you. A friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine, told me an incredible story of mercy. He had a young couple come to him for some counseling uh, because their marriage was in terrible trouble. It turns out that the woman had had a, an extramarital affair with a man at work, and she was pregnant by this man. When her husband found out, he was deeply hurt and wounded, as you can imagine. And he had every right to condemn her, to divorce her, and to be bitter. And she was ready to understand that. She was understood if he wanted to go along and and uh, divorce her. But after wrestling for a few months with this, the man decided that as a Christian, that he was going to deal with her in the same way that God had dealt with him. And he forgave her out of love and mercy. And that mercy... It transformed her. It relieved her from the guilt that she, and shame that she had. And she was gracious. She was grateful. He chose to adopt the son as his own. And most people didn't know the story. They didn't know that this was someone else's son. And he said that he couldn't love this boy any more than if it was his own son. That is mercy at work in his life and in his family, and after many, many years, that family is still happy. They have a happy marriage and family. Now, I don't know. That seems impossible to do unless you know mercy. How do you know if you're a person of mercy? How do you know if you're that person? Well, I think one thing that would tell us is that you go out of your way to be kind to and extend mercy to those who have offended you and hurt you, who have made you miserable. Now, it's not like going out to kill them with kindness. That, that would be try to humiliate them in some way, but it's going to another person with compassion and understanding and, and care. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, 15. If you don't forgive others their sin, neither will your Father forgive you. Those are some pretty strong words, aren't they? In Matthew 7, 2, Jesus says, the measure you give will be the measure you get. And then in Luke 6, Jesus goes to the furthest extent to say, love your enemies. Oh, no, love them. Do good to those who hate you. It's the last thing that I feel like doing to someone who has hated me. But that's what Jesus did, didn't he? That's how he loved. Now, finally, if you know the mercy of God, this is another sign. You will want to carry the burdens of other people. You'll want to help them in their time of need. People of mercy, they're always out there helping, aren't they? They're looking for someone who is hurting or searching or broken and seek to help them. People of mercy try to see things through the eyes of other people. They try to walk where in places that they have walked, walk in their shoes. Isn't that what God did in Jesus Christ? Walking in our shoes as a human being. Jesus got hurt. He got tired. He got cold and hungry. Just like you and me. Jesus was misunderstood. He was lonely. And he was rejected. Just like you and me are at times. 
And when he saw somebody who was hurting or suffering, he entered into their pain. He actually felt their pain and suffering and took it in to himself. It says he was moved with compassion. The word means literally moved in your guts. You feel it. Have you, have you felt that? You know, you've been so moved. I remember when my, my brother got beat up and he was um, almost killed. And, and he called home. Um, he lived several hundred miles away. And he called home and he, and he was crying. He was, he was uh, needing help. And, and I just remember it, it hit me in my guts. I almost felt sick hearing how wounded and, and, uh, and how much he was hurt. That's what happens with Jesus. He feels the hurt and pain that you and I go through. He, he's moved to compassion, and then he's moved into loving action. That's a merciful person. They identify with people, and they carry their burdens. Whether they're a friend or a stranger, whether they're unworthy or worthy, even enemies. Why? Because mercy is the right thing to do. Mercy is the right thing. Tony Campolo tells of a conversation that he had with uh, Peter Arnett. You may remember Peter Arnett on CNN. He was a commentator on CNN. And he was uh, covering a story in Israel. And uh, it, it's bad in Israel today, just like it was then on the West Bank. And he was there when an explosion went off. And uh, bodies were blown through the air. There were body parts everywhere. It was a terrible scene. And he says, everywhere I looked, there were signs of death and destruction. The screams of the wounded seemed to be everywhere around me. And a man came running up to me, holding a bloodied girl in his arms. And he pleaded, Mr., Mr., please, please get me to the hospital. Israeli troops have sealed off the area and no one can get in and out. And you're a member of the press and you can get out. Please, mister, if you don't help me, she's going to die. Peter went ahead and put them into the, his car. And he got through the sealed area into the hospital in Jerusalem. The whole time as he was hurtling down the highway... Towards the hospital, the man kept pleading, please, can you go faster? I'm losing her. Please, go faster. And when they get to the hospital, the girl was rushed into surgery. And this, these two men, Peter and this man who carried the girl to him, went to the waiting area, and they just sat there silently. They were in silence, and they were just too exhausted to even talk to each other. After a while, the doctor came out and said solemnly, she's dead. She didn't make it. I'm sorry. Well, the man collapsed in tears, and as Peter put his arm around him, he said, I really don't know what to say. I don't know what it's like to lose a child. I can't imagine what you're going through. And then the man looked up, startled, and, and said to Peter, Oh, mister, that Palestinian girl is not my daughter. You see, I am an Israeli settler. That Palestinian is not my child. But, mister, there comes a time when when each of us must realize that every child is our child. Every child is a son or daughter. There must come a time when we realize that we are all family. That's mercy. That's what God wants. That's the presence of God. Jesus came into the world to bring us mercy so that we could become people of mercy. Every act of mercy will draw you closer 
to God and draw others closer to God. Every time we refuse mercy to someone, it distances us from God. Every time you show mercy, you will become more like Jesus. People will see Jesus in you. You always can change the world. You can change your world wherever you are, in your neighborhood, at work, in this community of Ripley and Jackson County. You can change it by becoming a person of mercy. Mercy transforms you. It will transform those around you. When we see others as God sees them, Created in the image of God. We talked about this in confirmation today. What does it mean to be created in the image of God? If you see every person, even those that you are at odds with, as a person created in the image of God, and treat them with mercy and compassion, you'll bring the best out of them. Because that's what God does for you and me. His mercy always makes us better. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us pray. O oh God of mercy, God of compassion and love, thank you. Thank you for loving us no matter what, without conditions. But Lord, you, you are one who is a just God too. You are against the evil, against the sin, against suffering and pain. And we thank you that instead of condemning us, you sent a Savior to save us. Lord, if there's anyone that doesn't know the mercy of the Savior today, whether they're here in this sanctuary or, or watching online, may today be the day that we say yes to Jesus, the merciful God, and receive that mercy. Change us, Lord, that we might be the people of mercy and change our world for Christ in whose name we pray and we offer ourselves. Amen. Let's stand. Jesus is merciful, and Jesus will say. I'd like to invite you to turn to your neighbor right now and, and just say to your neighbor, may the mercy and peace of Christ be with you. May the mercy of Christ be with you. I can't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh.
And now let us receive the mercy of God and go be those people of mercy in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.